oh my God, I have to post this thing or I have to like do this uh, for from a financial standpoint. I still want to and and I aim to, but I've also like gotten to a point in this where I've tried to like do that. And sometimes when you try to like overcome those, like that, those bouts of burnout, the content that you put out isn't as great. Um, mm. And I do my best to avoid putting out content that, you know, I wouldn't be proud of or I wouldn't like. What's going on, guys? It's your boy, Tom Talk Flourish, and stand back for another interview. This time, I'm joined by the one and only Omar from Real Take Wrestling and Real Take Sports. So welcome on the show, my friend. Thank you, Tom. It's wonderful being here. Um, as I think I told you before, like been watching your interviews for a while, and I'm grateful to, you know, be a part of the show. I'm very excited to chat with you, my friend. But before we dive into any of your current work, the fans need to know, my friend, where do you first discover wrestling as an overall fan? So it's an interesting question. I feel like the cliche is like, you know, uh, wrestling was always on like in the background or whatever, or, like my family was watching it. But for me, it's true. I mean, wrestling was always on like my brother, my dad, even my so my uncles like all like we're always watch wrestling um my family's from pakistan actually mm -hmm. and like my dad would like would tell tell me like you know he used to watch like you know texas wrestling which is like the only wrestling that used to be on in the country at the time um and when he was younger so like it's been like a family thing for a while for me i remember the first time i really got into pro wrestling like watching week to week and really into it was like 2003 um mm. and it was like the show was like survivor series 2003 that was the one where they had uh taker versus mcmahon buried alive um and then like you know i i like slowly got into it and then like the story from like royal rumble 2004 to mania like 2004 i would think it was wrestlemania 20 like that's what like mm. got me like hooked as a fan like all those stories it was like guerrero there was the triple threat like um that like stretch really is what like solidified me as a fan. There's some sensitivity around your fandom because of what happened with uh, Chris Benoit and him winning the Rumble that year and uh, winning and winning the main event of WrestleMania. So how did that? When w I'm trying to talk about this sensitively, it's something I'm working on as an interview. I'm not gonna lie. So mm -hmm. when that tragedy did happen. Did you, did that change your fandom at all? Absolutely. Um, and, and I was like, I, I was like young. I was like nine years old when, um, you know, that happened. And, and, you know, it changed my perspective on a lot of things because like, you know, like you're nine years old, like you're, I was just watching wrestling. So, you know, I didn't know, like, I, or I didn't really think about like, you know, everything that was going into it or like the personal lives or anything. But when that happened, it did kind of make me, I think, take a step back and it changed the way that I viewed pro wrestling. It went from being, you know, Oh, these are like characters and, and like people like that, like, you know, I love and it and, and, you know, like have this connection with like as a young child, which we all do like, you know, and mm, in our own way, whenever we were watching wrestling, especially young, but it kind of forced me to like think mature my, uh, my the way I watch wrestling a little bit to be like okay there needs like I can't get too attached to pro wrestlers um because like at the end of the day and it's something that like I tell people all the time we don't know these people right we don't know what's going on in their lives we don't know what's going on you know in their heads a lot of times like they are people who entertain us but at the end of the day they ha also have like and do things we don't know about so Obviously, it was a very complex time, and there's a reason why I did not mention, you know, that person's name uh, when I was talking about, like, my fandom and, and mm -hmm. how I got into wrestling. And, like, that's why, like, I I've come to a place where I'm, I've, uh, you know, accepted, like, that is, you asked the question, why, how did I get into wrestling? That's when, and that's how. Um, but it's not, not something that, you know, like, I dwell on or try to. As it's a moment that, solidified your fandom can you go back and watch those moments or have they been tainted for you for lack of a better word um 
It depends. Uh, th there are times where I like try to go back and watch some of that stuff, and I can't. Uh, I I've noticed this. Like, if I go back, at, like in a more like you know analytical way, like you know, like if I'm like doing like a retro review or something like that, like that way that allows me, I think, to kind of take my own like personal uh, views bias? out of it, and my bias out of it. There we go. I think that's a word. Yeah. No. Totally. And I, I like then like I'm able to like look at the show for what it is. Um, but yeah, I mean it, it it's hard sometimes, yeah. I understand what you're saying completely there. So going back to when you first discovered wrestling, are you someone that's like, I'm all in as soon as you discovered your family were fans and things like that? Or were you someone that slowly had to be convinced? Oh, I was I, I was all in. Like the professional wrestling like but this was before i discovered like you know like sports like like basketball american football any of that like and i'm really into those things now but before i got into any of that pro wrestling was like my thing i would come home from school excited as all heck on monday nights and be like i can't wait to see what happens on raw tonight i can't wait to see you know yeah. like what edge does to john Cena or whatever right um so for me like it was always something to look forward to and you know, like that excitement from when I was at school, you know, like, like that was like something that would help me kind of get through like the tough days, you know, not only in school, but in life in general. And like, mm -hmm. it's, I think uh, something that a lot of fans have mentioned before, I, I'm sure like pro wrestling just kind of always been there and you, it's, it's been that distraction. You talk about it being a distraction now, how, before we get into your work as a content creator, how mm -hmm. do you use wrestling now if you almost have to do it as sort of a job slash hobby, if that makes sense for a podcast. I mean, it, so it, it's kind of, um, it's an interesting question because I have to like, it, it's kind of like how I explained before. When I look at wrestling from an analytical point of view and I'm like reviewing it or, you know, or whatever, it, it, I, I'm able to like kind of take my bias and my mind out of it and just look at things for what they are. That being said, I'm still a fan, like, especially if I'm at a show live, you know, I'm still mm -hmm. going to be cheering when I remember I was at Wrestle Dream uh, when uh, Adam Copeland slash Edge made his AEW debut and I lost my mind. I was like I in the imagine. media section or whatever, but like, I didn't care. I was like, OK, look, you can make fun of me. Call me a, a mark, whatever. I lost my mind because. At the end of the day, whether you're, you know, I think reviewing wrestling or you're a content creator, you're press, whatever, those exciting moments are what you live for. And at the end of the day, if you can't enjoy those moments, and I'm not trying to hate on anyone, like everyone experiences things in a different way. But if you can't enjoy those moments in your own way, I, I think like, you know, what's the point of watching? Mm, I fully agree. So when you talk about being press and things like that, and those exciting moments, have you had a moment where... You talk about enjoying them, but have you had a moment where you've been like, okay, got to look around and be professional, but this is my, uh, uh, in the words of uh, Matt Stryker when Booker T showed up at the 2011 Royal Rumble, it's a mark out moment, bro. I'm marking out. I love that. Um, So it, it, the, the biggest struggle I had was at that Russell Dream show. So at the post-show media scrum, when uh they brought out like, it's weird. I was actually talking to Kenny Baum, another content creator, about this mm -hmm. the other day, and I was I was telling him how you know like I feel like that specific media scrum was like a like fully structured to keep me there the entire time because I originally planned like okay maybe I'll ask a few questions and I'll leave, but I ended up saying the entire like two hours or whatever, and it was because like it had Adam Copeland. And then it had Brian Danielson. Then it had Shibata, who were like three of my favorite wrestlers of all time. Mm. You know, so like when they're like, so when Brian Danielson is literally walking past me, who I think is like the greatest pro wrestler of all time, I'm sitting there like trying with every fiber of my being to be, you know, very posh and like, you know, straightforward. But I'm also like on the inside. Oh, my God, that's Brian Danielson screaming like, you know, a 10 year old kid. So it's a give and take, you know, I, I think the way I take and, and view pro wrestling press, like obviously like in media in general, I, I don't really necessarily like to use the word press, but the, the way I view it is like, again, we're all fans at the end of the day. 
and it's good to enjoy things. You probably shouldn't be like, oh my God, Brian Danielson, you're the greatest wrestler in the world and like a media scrum. But at the same time, like, you know, it's wrestling. Mm. I do see what you're saying there. You talk about it, it's wrestling, like that was your words. So yeah. you talk about that. And have you, do you think, like, we talk about how media and things like that for wrestling. So how did you get into this crazy world that is content creation? Oh, that's a that's a very good question. So um my favorite way and, and medium to, you know, I guess consume content has always been like podcast, or at least for the past like 10 years, it's been podcasting. Yeah, yeah. So so when the pandemic happened, right? I was stuck in my house, you know, and like had nothing to do, had a lot of time on my hands. And I would talk to my friends about, hey, let's start a podcast. Let's start a podcast. Let's like, you know, basically fill up our time. And it kind of became a way for me to like have like a designated time to like kind of talk to my friends remotely, catch up, you know, maintain those relationships during the pandemic, which was like very hard for me personally. And I know a lot of other people out there, I'm sure. Mm. Um so like that's when I started Real Take Sports and like we did like that as a podcast. Eventually that became a YouTube thing. Uh, then I did some like other podcasting around like, you know, like more social political issues. Um, and then eventually I got into like wrestling podcasting and like it was something I would always talk about. Uh, but like, mm. you know, when I actually did it and with uh, my co-host on OT Graps, shout out to Trevor, but like. I remember like w when I did it, it was like originally on like the real take sports channel, you know, and it was kind of like I was trying to do too much on one channel. And like I ended up having to like create real take wrestling, which became its own thing. So that's kind of how I became just came on there. Like it was a way for me to to just talk to my friends during the pandemic. And now it's spiraled into whatever this is. Oh, that's very, very cool, my friend. I'm curious to know because I know the answer for myself because I was also a pandemic. Mm -hmm. But do you think you would be in this crazy world if the pandemic never happened? It's hard for me to say, but I doubt it because I doubt that I would have had the time. I doubt that mm -hmm. I would have given myself the time. And obviously the pandemic was a horrible, horrible time for the world. But, you know, if there's like one positive I can take away from it, it, it is that it allowed me and I'm very, very fortunate in this, like, and I don't take that lightly, but it allowed me the time to like use my energy and fulfill myself creatively. And I'm still doing that to this day. And I'm thankful as all heck <laughs> about that. How do you balance then? Because obviously when the pandemic happened, I assume you weren't working because we were all stuck at home at that point. So how do you now balance your content creation side with a shoot job for lack of a better word um so it, it's interesting because um my shoot job is like basically like you know kind of close to content creation it's like digital marketing so i i spend a lot of times like you know like helping with social media strategy things like that so it's kind of in the same space and it's weird. It makes things easier sometimes, but also way more difficult other times because when I'm more burnt out, I tend to just kind of ignore like Twitter slash X and like mm. promoting my stuff. And, you know, like even like creating a video, I'm just like, I don't have the energy to like look at a screen for another two hours or whatever. But then other times and, and in other ways, like it has helped me become a better creator because I think more critically about the content that I put out. I think more critically about my schedule. I think more critically about my thumbnails, titles, all those kinds of things that, you know, obviously like as YouTubers, like we need to, to like think about, uh, to see what works. So in ways it's made me a way better content creator in other ways. It's just kind of made me lazy. <laughs> mm, I understand what you're saying completely there. So you talked about uh, your shoot job being in marketing. So how mm. did that help you when it came to uh, your, this is how I'm going to brand my the Real Talk channel and things like that. And this is how we're going to separate it from Real Talk Sports, for example. For sure. Um, so the, the interesting thing is. I realized I botched. Oh, I realized I botched, by the way. Uh, it's Real Take Sports, not Real Talk Sports. I do apologize. 
you're totally fine, Tom. Um, but it, it's interesting you say that. So quick aside, the, the original. So what originally happened was, again, I was doing everything on one channel, like Real Take Sports. And, you know, it was it it wasn't doing like fantastic, but I was having fun. I was like doing podcasts and like, like it, it was a hobby for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then I met. It actually, like a, a content creator by the name of Ango, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Uh, he reached out to me, and, and he's like a wrestling like content creator. Um, and you know, like we were talking, he came on my show. I had or I went, I had the opportunity to go on his show, and he was the first person to kind of reach out to me and say like, "Hey, maybe you should separate this out, and maybe hmm. you should, you know, have a separate channel sense. for." real take wrestling so that you yeah. can cater more to the wrestling fans who, you know, might not care about sports or whatever. And like, at first, like I was always hesitant to that idea. Cause I was like, Oh, like I've already built up like, you know, whatever audience was mm -hmm. like, I think at the time, like a thousand subscribers, um, which is like, as you know, no small feat, but like, but at the time I was just like, you know, like I, I was hesitant to do that, but like hearing someone, you know, who had like amassed a large following at the time and, you know, had like taken the opportunity to reach out to me to to you know give that advice i i took it seriously and i that night literally we did a stream and then i created real take wrestling not knowing what would happen yet here i am and i am blessed to have uh 20 000 subscribers at this point don't know how that happened in in less than two years but you know i, I think from like from that perspective like it, it taught me that taught me that you know catering to your audience and like, you know, kind of separating out the, your, your channels by like niche areas and by mm -hmm. interest is, is a lot easier uh, for you to gain a more loyal following. Because again, people could like, you know, basketball, but they're not going to be the same people who like football. People could like, you know, a uh, wrestling, but they're not going to be the same people who like basketball. So like having those on the same channel just never made sense. And it took me that. And plus like my job, which, you know, kind of taught me to, look at audience targeting, look at things like, you know, who am I marketing to? Like, you know, and mm -hmm. how do I get the best return on investment? How do I get most of my subscribers who are there to like click on every video? How do I get, you know, people engaged more in my videos? I, and I think, you know, both my experience talking to other people who, who are in the space as well as like my job have really helped me become a better creator. I'm by no, no means a great one yet, but I hope to be. I disagree massively. As someone that loves your work, my friend, I think you are in the pantheon of some of the greats at the moment. I appreciate that. So you did talk about the separating your content and stuff, but mm. how do you cross promote sometimes when maybe you realize this clip could work for Real Talk Sports and we might be able to bring some fans over to Real Talk Wrestling and vice versa? So it rarely ever happens now, especially like Real Take Sports. I Real Take Sports I have rebranded a few times, uh, just because it, it's been. It, I don't do as much sports podcasting as I, I used to, and I've kind of like committed that to more you know long form video essays now. Mm -hmm. Um, so every time I like put out a video essay, I will like you know promote it on my YouTube community tab on Real Take uh, Wrestling. You know, and and that that has actually helped get like, few, uh, like quite a few people over to that channel, which is great. Um, I hope to do more of it. I, I, I one thing I am wary of though as a content creator, and I think like others probably should be as well, is like, you know, you don't want to oversaturate the amount of times you do that, because mm -hmm. if you do, people who like follow you or your subscribers are going to look and just kind of like see okay, this is just that person who promotes like their other stuff. So I guess like for me, the decision to, you know, whether or not to promote something is threefold. Number one, how important is this content, you know, that I want, do I actually want as many people as possible to see it? Like, obviously you always do, but like, you know, is it like critical, like that everyone sees it? Number two, do I think that the people, you know, who are in this space who might not necessarily be like fans of like American football, which is what I make a lot of my videos about, are they going to be really into this? And, you know, is it worth potentially, you know, not like, you know, obviously turning them off, but like, like them checking out and like scrolling past this, could I put something else 
like of more value to them? Could I promote like one of my real take wrestling videos or a video on like one of my other channels, real take uh, or wrestle vibes? Like there's a lot that goes into like thinking about that cross promotional stuff. Um, to me, like now I've got it down to like a weird science where I, it's hard to explain for me sometimes, but like in my head, it makes sense where I'm like, this is definitely worth promoting. This isn't, we'll hold on this and like, we'll find a different way to promote it. Um, so that's kind of how I view that. And I've also found that like, honestly, like short form content for me is like mm. kind of my way of promoting my, you know, larger projects like video essays or things like that. So I've also like helped try to use that as much as possible. So that's very, very cool. You talked about their, your sort of strategies for content creation, but how do you sort of make sure that you're creating content you want to create, for lack of a better word, and not just creating, as a good friend of mine said to me the other day, for the numbers? It is it's a weird battle because for a while I was very much against creating stuff for the numbers. Uh, and to this day, I kind of like, I try my best not to. There are times where it's unavoidable, where there's like mm. large stories in wrestling that you kind of have to talk about. One of them is the Vince McMahon um, allegations, which are horrifying, vile and disgusting in my view, but they are, they are a massive story. And, you know, I, I, also feel like I have a perspective from both the business standpoint and, you know, breaking down the legalities of it and, and you know, what, what can move forward. I, I feel like I bring value to that in a way. So I, I kind of feel compelled to talk about like things like that. I, in my view, I would much rather not, but it's also like, it's a massive story. Um, the, the things that I typically enjoy talking about are like, you know, stories about people's returns. To wrestling you know like like mm -hmm. I, you'll see a lot of like that kind of stuff like in my in my uh feed like people's return to wrestling kind of like what they could do next and like booking that kind of stuff those are the videos i enjoy the most and i i started doing those you know about a year ago and they've been some of the best like performers on the channel luckily so like i want to do more of those um but you know at the end of the day like sometimes you do have to do things you know not for the numbers solely but you know partially at least like you know to cover wrestling injuries cover like news that you know is unfortunate you wouldn't want to do but so again it's a mixed bag but i try to do my best and and at the end of the day offer like my audience you know the best value possible mm, i understand what you're saying completely there so you talk about offering the best value there you're mm -hmm. someone i feel could give a lot of great advice for aspiring content so what are, Omar, your three pieces of advice that you're like, I would, if you're going to start a channel, podcast, et cetera, these are the, mis maybe not mistakes, these are things I did in the early days that I wouldn't do now, and these are some things that you should do if you want to get your channel off the ground. So for me, I mean, the, the number one thing would be to test out, like, every feature that YouTube or whatever platform you're using has to offer. That's my number one know and understand how every feature works whether it's short form whether it's live video whether it's vertical live videos like all these different tools that you have on, on across platforms whether it's tiktok or whatever like kind of know and understand them play with them test them out that way if you know you find that you know that's something you're good at something that's something you want to do you'll have that experience and mm. that and that expertise for lack of a better term to, to actually go out and execute that. I think that's a very important part of, of content creation, just knowing all the features and tools you have to your disposal. Because I could do, for example, like I could do a booking video if I wanted to, but it's not going to work well on a live stream compared to like, you know, a review show of a show that just went off the air, right? So it, it's kind of like knowing all these things kind of help you create content and cater content in those kinds of different uh, bu buckets, like depending on those features. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the other mistake or the mistake I would say that I made early on was pretending to be something I'm not. And Ooh, interesting. And it, it's something that I think is, is kind of natural for a lot of people to do. And we all kind of do it. Even me to this day, I feel like we kind of in our minds, when we start content creating, we, we don't have a, 
we don't have that comfort with our voice. We don't have that comfort with the way we, or, or a lot of us, I'm not sure. I'm sure pe people have, but like, at least for me, I was never like that comfortable in the beginning, like with my voice, I have a very high voice, you know, and I've gone to, <laughs> to different lengths to try to hide that and project more, but you know, it took me a while to get comfortable with that. And, you know, I was trying to, you know, emulate like other sports podcasters or, you know, things like that. And when radio hosts that were not really working and they weren't working for the audience and they definitely weren't working for me because that's not who I am. It took me a while, but I finally realized that the best thing that I can do is to be myself. And that's what people crave. Like, the I think the, the days of like people, you know, being, you know, like like on screen, like heads on like, you know, ESPN or or Fox Sports, whatever. Right. Uh, th those days are kind of like I say, like they're kind of over uh, like we are definitely moving towards a more like, I think, natural, authentic vibe and what people prefer from their mm -hmm. commentary on across a lot of different spheres. So I would just say be authentic as possible. Obviously, no one's going to expect you to get it early on. It took me honestly like a year, year and a half before I actually got comfortable and stopped caring about like how my voice sounded or, you know, things like that. Like I used to do weird stuff like I would deepen my voice in like in um audition, like an Adobe audition to try to like make it sound better, but you know, now I mean, it's unavoidable. I I am who I am and I just got to be proud of that. And that's what I try to be. Um, and then the other last piece of advice I would give to other creators is just interact with your audience. Um, even if you have like a hundred hardcore, you know, fans or 10 hardcore, whatever it is, however big the, the audience is, if you have like a set group of people that are like ride or die with you and your channel or you and your platform, whatever, interact with them do like make time to do q and a's make time to build those relationships because it's not only going to help you out and like you know you know obviously like make them more engaged to the channel but even bigger than that it's a way to kind of you know it, it it's a way to kind of like give back to them for their dedication because a lot of times people just want to like converse and for me it's one of the coolest things like I've had streams where I've had like, you know, thousands of people tune in and I'm less like, okay, yeah, this is great. This is fun. But like the streams where I've had like, you know, 10 people tune in, like those early streams of, of me podcasting or doing like live watch alongs, like those are the ones where I'm just like, or where I feel like I had the most fun. Cause I was literally having a conversation with people through the chat and I love that. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I feel like, you know, like a lot of times like content creators tend to, to like, you know, take that for granted. And we all, again, it's natural. Like we all like skips our mind or we just get caught up in what we're doing. But that's something that I really, really try my best not to take for granted. And, and like, I try to dedicate time for that uh, as much as possible, just because I love my audience and I want to interact with them and I want to hear what they want to talk about and vice versa. That's very, very cool. Something we really skipped over and we really shouldn't have is you talked about burnout uh, previous in this conversation. Mm. I didn't mean to skip over it. It's just how the conversation went, and I do apologize. But you talked about getting burned out and sometimes just completely going off Twitter, not promoting and things like that. I've been there. So what do you now do on those days where you think, I'm getting burned out, I need to step away? I just step away. I mean, I am, I am lucky enough to be in a position where you know, I have like a full time job where, mm. you know, I, you know, am able to pay my bills and do everything that I need to. So for me, it, it's not as important to like, you know, oh, my God, I have to post this thing or I have to like do this uh, for from a financial standpoint. I still want to and, and I aim to. But I've also like gotten to a point in this where. I've tried to like do that. And sometimes when you try to like overcome those, like that, those bouts of burnout, the content that you put out isn't as great. Um, mm. And 
I do my best to avoid putting out content that, you know, I wouldn't be proud of or I wouldn't like. Um, so for me, I mean, it, it's just giving myself time. And it's something that I didn't used to do a lot when I was younger. But I really have find important now just giving myself time to step away, read a book, you know, go on a walk or, you know, hang out with friends. That's very, very cool. So you obviously talked about earlier in this conversation, connecting with the great man that is Kenny Bomb and many Love other him. content creators. So for a very good sort of some content, where do you two first connect and how did that start a working relationship? Um, God, where, when did I first meet Kenny? Um, I think, I, I, I think I did, I just like saw him on Twitter, um, a, like one day, like as, as most great wrestling relationships at this point are, yeah. are made, it's on Twitter. Um, but like, I, I think I just like scroll past him on Twitter. I uh, was promoting one of, one of his videos and, you know, I, I like started watching it and I was like, oh, this is really cool. Um, and then I think I like DM'd him just being like, Hey, like, just want to let you know, fan of your work, like, you ever want to, like, collab or do anything, open to it. And then, like, we'd go back and forth for a little bit. Uh, and the first time I had him on, I think, was the lead up to Wrestle Dream. Mm. And, like, we did, like, a review show. And, you know, that's when I, I really, first time I met him, really talked to him. And we had, like, a connection, good energy, like, from the jump. Um, and, you know, like, I've been on his channels. He's been on mine. And, you know, I, I feel like I, I I am fortunate to have met someone like Kenny who is genuine, who is nice, who is like just like one of the, like the best, I think, people out there. Like I've, I've had the chance to go to like two wrestling shows with him. I'm going to see him at Mania. Um, Yeah, I mean, like he's like one of the most like just down to earth, like genuine people uh, that, that I've met in like um in like wrestling media whatever um but yeah great guy i 100 percent agree my friend so you we brought up wrestle dream a few times in this conversation yeah. so was that your first sort of event as official media yep it was so take me back to that moment where you're like i i'm trying to think about how to word this but like I think my words, my work's good enough to apply for media credits. I mean, so a bit of backstory. Please. I've been applying for media credits, uh, like uh, or credentials, like you know, a little bit, a few months leading up to that, you know, and and I hadn't been accepted up until that point. Um, and I remember when I first got it, you know, there was like that moment where you're just like, yes, like you know, like mm. it. it in a way, and and again, not that I need anyone's validation, or or I, or I that's something like I depend on. Like I don't need anyone's validation. I know my work, and I know it's not the best, but it is my work, and I'm proud of it. But at the same time, you know that like AEW at the time acknowledging that was really cool, and in a way, it you know gave me that feeling of like okay, like all this work all the times, all the late night streams, all that kind of stuff was kind of worth it. So it was cool. It was a cool moment for me. Um, and getting to be there in the room was also really cool. And getting to ask uh, questions to like the likes of Christian Cage, MJF. Awesome. And for people that may not know, who may have not seen the media scrums, et cetera, can you pinpoint a specific moment where you're like, if you look at this moment, I, I ask this question. For sure. Um, if you go to like, you go to the Russell Dream Media Scrum, go to uh, MJF's uh, time. I'm, I was the one who asked him his thoughts on Adam Copeland and his debut in AEW. That's which, absurd. yeah, got a really cool answer about, like, the roster. I also, I asked Christian Cage, which is, this was really funny. Uh, I asked him, like, it was like, I think at one point what happened was, I, I was like, they make you say your name, right? They're like, yeah, you know, state your name and your outlet, whatever. And I was like, okay, yeah. Umar Q from Real Take Wrestling. That's the, what I say. And Christian just like immediately interrupts me in mid question, goes, what? <laughs> and I, I, I'm like, is he working? <laughs> like, I don't know. So, like, there was like a moment where I kind of basically forgot my question. And I ended up asking him something like kind of off the mark a little bit. I was like, 
Like, what did you think when you were like taking apart the ring and you were attacking Darby Allen? A little bit more like storyline related question, but uh, Tony Khan like ended up like literally like taking Christian's non answer and like turning it into a whole like little like exchange between the two. So that was really cool. Um, but yeah, those two moments really stand out to me as uh, two cool things that I can say like I've done. You talk about the cool things you've done there, Omar, but what are some of your goals for 2024 as we record this and to be on for Real Take Wrestling and Real Take Sports? So uh, for Real Take Sports, it's definitely like actually like posting <laughs> like videos and, and getting those out. Um, just finished a few scripts, so hopefully going to record those and have those uh, out over the next weeks and months. For Real Take Wrestling, I mean, the big thing and the big hump that I have yet to really overcome is doing interviews. And it's not from like lack of, and it doesn't come from, I should say, lack of desire. It is mostly because I get busy. <laughs> and, you yeah, know, yeah. it's, as you know, like you get into the cycle of like living your daily life, doing work, doing, you know, everything else you got to do. And then you do this YouTube thing. And you have to get like the basics done. I have to get my date, my news video done. I have to get like, you know, my shorts clipped. I have to prepare for the podcast. So it, it, it's something that gets kind of lost in the shuffle. That being said, I have, I, I'm a person who has to write things down to get things done. I have like sticky notes and, uh, you know, note tabs all over everywhere. Um, uh, So I have an outline of like how to accomplish like the, the interview thing and who I'm going to reach out to. So Look for that in 2024 in Real Take Wrestling. Hopefully some interviews. That's very, very cool, my friend. So as we look at wrapping this up, Omar, because I do want to be respectful of your time, uh, no. I have two questions for you before we do my two sort of wrap-up segments, for lack cool. of a better word. So first of all, do you view your career in wrestling media as an overall success, for one? And if you stepped away, what would you want your legacy as a creator to be? Oh, that's a very deep question. Um, we get deep on this show. I don't know I, if you I, know. Oh, I, I'm I'm well aware. It's just be, sitting in the chair here. It's, I'm just like, oh, it's it's hitting me. It's hit me directly. Um, for me, if I were to, sorry, your first question was, well, if I were to step away, you know, what what would I want my legacy to be? And then your second one was, uh, if I, sorry, what was it? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm... If you stepped away, would you view your career as a success? Mm -hmm. And then the second question was, what would you want your legacy to be if you stepped away? Gotcha. Thanks. Uh, so if I stepped away, yes, it would be a success because I got to make videos about one of the things that I love doing more than anything else in the world, which is watch pro wrestling and have people entertained, engaged, and you know, informed by it. And that is really mm -hmm. cool for me. My legacy is something that, you know, obviously like we are, none of us get to write our own legacy is, is a cliche as that sounds. However, I would at least want to be remembered as someone who, you know, was authentic, but also at the same time, wasn't, a complete try not to curse uh wasn't wasn't a mean person um because i feel like in wrestling a lot of times and and again there's a lot of wonderful content creators out there who, who are not this but you do have a few creators who are not the nicest people on twitter or mm -hmm. to their fans or whatever um and i do my best to like keep it light so I would hope that I'm remembered as, you know, just someone who was there for the fun, who informed people, had fun, and, you know, was just enjoyable. I understand what you're saying completely. There. This is a complete self-indulgent question, but we've been talking for about 30 to 40 minutes. I'm not exactly sure, but about mm -hmm. 30 to 40 minutes now. Where can I improve as we record this and things like that? No, I, I mean, I think you're doing great. Honestly, like uh, you are your way of like a like asking questions kind of off the cuff and like, you know, taking my answers and and morphing them into questions as we go along is 
is something that I wish I could do. Um, I'm, and it's like one of the things that honestly, like, I think about a lot, like, how am I going to like do that off the cuff if I ever do interviews? So I think like you're doing, you're doing great. And the only thing that I would like even say to you is like, just, and you know this, like be comfortable with your voice because you're mm -hmm. doing a great job. And I know there's a lot of people out there who like love your content. I really appreciate that, my friend. So as we look at wrapping this up, Omar, I alluded mm -hmm. to you in our conversation off camera. We're going to do a segment that I call Generic Questions. Those Love of you that have seen my interviews before, I know this is where I ask my guest, uh, Omar's favorite overall wrestling match, favorite uh, pay-per-view card, such as Double or Nothing 2019, favorite wrestler's entrance team, favorite tag team, and favorite wrestler. Basically the questions that I assume Omar might be asked on social media. So now he'll have a place to be like, look, I have answered this. Please go watch this. So what's your favorite match of all time? Favorite match of all time. And again, this is not the best match. It's my favorite match is Brian Danielson, Kenny Omega, Grand Slam uh, 2021. I don't care if it was a draw. It For me, that was a match that one of the things I was most worried about was, will it live up to the hype? And for me, it did. And then some, it it was exactly what I wanted. It was, in my view, a lot of the ways, the perfect wrestling match. Two of my favorite wrestlers going at it at a time where AEW was at its hottest. Like, loved it. What about your favorite overall pay-per-view card? Okay, so I, I feel like saying WrestleMania X7 is a cop-out, so I'm not going to say that. Um, <laughs> but I will go with All Out 2021. I think... Outside of X7, over the past like 20 or so years, it was the best pay-per-view that any wrestling companies put on. Like, not just because of the surprises at the end and Ruby Soho as well, but CM Punk's return, Eddie Kingston versus Muir going into it, like was like a really hot feud that people forget about. In my and view, a very underrated match. Very underrated match. Uh Redeemer, redeem anyway. Uh <laughs> Not gonna finish that sentence, but um, but like you know, like and then the steel cage match, obviously, like which in my view is like one of the best tag team matches of all time. Young Bucks versus Lucha Bros. Like there was so much on that pay per view to remember. Even and Paul White QT Marshall is fun. Even, like that's what I'm saying. Even that, even even the P break match was 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 a great match or like a great time. So I think, and and for that to come from a a non WWE like entity it, it it raised the bar and I thought like for me I came away from that you know very happy and just excited for what's to come and yeah that's why it's my favorite pay per view. That's very very cool, my friend. So uh, what, what was the rest? Oh yeah, wrestlers. What's your favorite wrestlers entrance team? Okay, this is a tough one, Tom. I am going to say, oh, actually, so it is CM Punk. Like, it, Cult of Personality, in my view, is, like, probably the greatest wrestling theme ever. Um, I, I think, like, it fit Punk so much well, and, you know, like, it's just synonymous at this point with him and, and pro wrestling, and it's going to get a pop <laughs> whenever it's played at any uh, wrestling-themed event ever. So, like, that's definitely up there. And the other one I want to give just a quick honorable mention to is uh, Brian Danielson's, like, current theme song. I know that's very controversial because people don't like the little, like, Oh, I, I, lo I love it. It's Man, underrated, he, in my opinion. He was born for greatness. Like, like he let, like, I'm just glad someone let him know. Um, uh, But, like, that one, and then, like, obviously Final Countdown, like, for Brian, which I got to witness live and... Not afraid to say oh, this. Yeah. I cried. I cried when Brian Danielson came out to Final Countdown. Was that at WrestleDream? That was. That right? was at All Out uh, in Chicago. Oh, when he fought Ricky Starks in the strap match. Yep. Oh, fantastic match too. Yeah. Phenomenal. Uh, what about your favorite tag team? Favorite tag team would probably be. Oof. My favorite tag team of all time is actually definitely Edge and Christian. Um, I thought that, you know, like going back and watching their work together is some of the funniest 
like heel like stuff that you will ever see. And the best part about it is they would go over in almost every match that they would have. Mm -hmm. So like not only were they able to like talk the talk, they were able to back it up and like just the the way that they've evolved through the years, I've just loved to see. So Edge and Christian. That's very, very cool, my friend. And finally, the biggest generic question, in my opinion, who is your favorite overall wrestler of all time? It's the greatest wrestler of all time. His name is Brian Danielson. I, yes, I love when people say this because he's my favorite of all time. As well. I, I think like at, at this point, like there is, we have reached a point and I'm glad we've come to this point where like there's an entire generation of not only wrestling fans, but wrestlers who like believe that Brian is like at least the pre previous generation's greatest wrestler of all time uh, or greatest wrestler. Like he is, he's so good. And the thing is, like we we talked about, like obviously the the controversies that happen after the Benoit um, tragedy. Like when that happened, I kind of like stepped away from wrestling a bit. Like the person who kind of like really got me into like wrestling outside of WWE at the time was like watching Brian in ROH, and his style of like you know, it was like it was like that very very in depth technical style where he was literally gonna like tie his opponents in knots and i was like this is like it feels like a sport and that was like the first time i viewed wrestling as like a, a sport for lack of a better term and a competition and that's like really evolved the way i view wrestling now and like i love those types of matches and brian is like probably the reason i have become an even bigger fan of pro wrestling he is in my view like probably the best all-around talent that pro wrestling has ever seen I think that when he steps away from full-time action, the wrestling world will be worse off because he's also genuinely one of the nicest people in pro wrestling uh, from what everyone says. But, you know, I the, the I could give you like an hour long, like monologue about Brian Danielson. Like he's, he's, he's the greatest. I fully agree with my friend. Cause as I said to you, he's my favorite of all time as well. So as we wrap this up, I obviously mm -hmm. want to say thank you for a great conversation. But the question I end this show on is, I believe as content creators, podcasters, or even just people with social media, we're all sort of going to live forever in some sort of very, very weird way, if you think very about scary. the world. So what is one piece of content you're like, I'd like to be remembered for that? And then what is one that you're like, yuck, please forget about that? I could give you a lot of content I'd like people to forget about. Um, I, I would say there, there's one... There's a there's like a four hour wrestling stream that has since been taken down uh, by me, where I was like having I don't know, I think I was like about to get COVID or something like I I had like a headache and it was like it was not a great stream I was watching some I was doing a watch along with some WWE pay per view, and I was just like not feeling well but I kind of like it was one of the ones where I was like I'm just gonna get through this you know like just get mm -hmm. through the stream I already promised it just do it. And it was it was a bad stream. Like I was just not engaging with the chat. I was not engaging with the match. I was just kind of sitting there. And you know, I'm someone who, when I'm on screen, I I can't just sit there because that weird. Like I I like to fill time, and I'm also like naturally a very like energetic guy. As I'm sure you've been able to tell over yeah. the past hour. Um, so like for me, like that was just obviously I was not proud of that. Um, and. You won't be able to see it ever. Um, so yeah, that's gone. But I would say like for me, wrestling things that I'm proud of, I'm I'm going to cop out and say two if that's okay. That's totally cool. Number one would be uh, the first time I did like a collab, uh, which was with um, this YouTuber called Ango. Um I did a collab with him and we were like talking about WrestleMania. Uh, it was right before Cody had returned. So it was like WrestleMania 38. Mm -hmm. um, and it was like a preview show. And, you know, like I was, I wasn't as comfortable, like obviously like talking to people that I, I didn't know, like all the podcasts I had done before that were with, were generally with people that I was friends with or people like, you know, I grew up with, but, um, but that was like something that I did and I was like really proud of. And the other one would be like, you know, just like literally being there in the room uh, at Russell Dream and like being able to like you know film that press conference and and like no matter what like I that's something I can say like I did that I was in that room I like if I never get invited to another media scrum if I never 
get invited to a press thing ever again, never do an interview. I can say like, you know, I made it there on my own and I'm so, and I take a lot of pride in that. As you well should, my friend, because you're very good at what you do. I'm not going to lie. So as we wrap yourself up, Omar, please promote yourself. Where can the good people find you, your work? Where should they subscribe, follow you on socials, etc.? Well, don't follow me on social media. You you will get a very a very mixed bag of of non wrestling things. But um, definitely, I uh, if you're gonna check me out for sure, go to youtube.com forward slash Real Take Wrestling for all you wrestling fans out there. Cover daily videos with news. Um, starting to put vlogs up from all the wonderful content that I've captured on the ground. Um, and you know, video essays, things like that. Also, a quick plug to this new project I'm doing called Wrestle Vibes. Uh, that's just youtube.com slash Russell Vibes. It's gonna be more like docu style content that I hope to get out there. Um, and then finally, like I just want to plug a uh, new channel that um my uh my co-host on my OT Graps show, uh Trevor is uh is gonna be managing called uh at OT Graps, youtube.com forward slash OT Graps. And that's we're gonna be a lot of fun stuff there. So those are my plugs. Also subscribe to Tom Talks Rubbish. Just hit that like button, guys. Thank you for that, my friend. I really <laughs> appreciate that. So he's well worth doing, guys. He like he just said, he's one of the nicest people in this space and one of the most hard working as well. So if you guys like this, make sure you like Share and subscribe to Tom Talk Fresh on YouTube. Follow me on Twitter or X. I can't do it when I've got the mic in my hand. Uh, I got you. At Tom Talks Rubbish. And I will see you in the next one. Goodbye now.